Then I'll hear it again Monday. I thought they'd watch it. <laughs> Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and others. If we have any others here tonight. It's a pretty good crowd. We don't usually get many others in the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall, but you never know. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical FM, and this is Carlos Comer, the music director of the Oregon Symphony. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. And uh, Carlos has cooked up an interesting concert for us tonight. It begins with a, a, a very famous, well-known, powerful Brahms overture, the tragic overture. I don't know how often it's actually performed, but it's very well known. It ends with the extremely popular Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number no. 3 with a fantastic young Chinese pianist who could be the next Horowitz, as far as we know. Uh, and in between, a kind of wacky symphony that is almost never performed. You'll probably never hear Nielsen's Sixth Symphony again. So interesting program. Um, how'd you put this one together, Maestro? Well, first of all, Yuja, I, I always wanted to get her here, and coincidence, coincidence, I have worked with Yuja this year already once. Uh, we were together in Cincinnati doing Bartok II, which is another of those animal concertos. And so I was very, very happy when I knew that, okay, in four months we are going to see each other again and have a really good time here in Oregon, and of course she has a great time with us. And we are going to do Rahmanov III, which is pretty much running in the opposite direction from the Bartok, because the Bartok is very, very strict in, in what you can do and timed very accurately, and you have to be insanely precise. Whereas in the Rahmanov, yes, you have to be precise and you have to have all these cap uh, technical capabilities that Yuja has anyway. But there is a lot of freedom in the music. It's a romantic piece of music. The Bartok is not. And so I thought, like, well, that's cool. <laughs> it's just very different. So I'm already thinking, well, Yuja, next time she comes, uh, Mozart? I don't know. Ooh, that would be nice. Something. Yuja Wong. She's 23. A tiny little thing. I just met her backstage. She's about this no, big. Come on, come on. No, no, no. <laughs> Can't weigh more than 100 pounds. Very sweet, carry friendly her around. person. <laughs> She's just adorable and incredibly talented. Well, she, she, she's really a very sweet, very young lady. Uh, and yesterday she revealed to me that she feels old because she's going to be 24 in a couple of weeks. I and mean, I thought like, oh, sure. <laughs> A lot of sympathy from you. Yeah, yeah. I thought like she was warming up backstage when I got here a few minutes ago, and, and she's playing the piano, and and she stopped and said, "It feels heavier today, or am I just heavier?" <laughs> That's the funny thing. <laughs> well, changing the weather or something. I don't yeah, know. there are always changes, and uh, it must be one of those dramatic things for all the pianists of the world who travel all around, and every time they go to a concert hall. It's always a new instrument that they have never touched, and they, of course, expect uh, that the piano will be uh, the kind of the same. Matter of fact, there are, I know of two pianists, one of them is not alive anymore, who always traveled with their own instrument, which is kind of costly. Which is, uh, brings me, no, I shouldn't tell, the, there is a story behind one. Do you know that the... the Ooh, do tell, you're committed now. He's know. committed now, right, he started. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's not, not a good story. Okay. One of them was Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, great pianist. For There is no better, if you check it out on recordings on YouTube, no better guy for Debussy, Ravel, all that. And the other is uh, Christian Zimmermann, the really enormously fantastic Polish pianist. He travels not with the piano, at least not abroad, but with the mechanics of the piano. So. There is no trouble in the touch. Well, from what I remember, one day there was a security issue because they found some traces of God forbid what substance here uh, in one of the American airports and they blew it up. Boom! Wow. <laughs> How do you notate that? Hmm? How do you notate that? 
blow up keyboard with I don't know. I think it made the news. Is that and and is that why we haven't seen him in this country lately? He was to to use an English term. Christian was not amused. Indeed. <laughs> okay. I back. wouldn't be either. <laughs> well, Horowitz traveled with his own piano a lot, too. Not all the time, but, but often. And as a matter of fact, the Horowitz piano, the last one that he traveled with, comes to Portland once in a while. They have it at Sherman Clay Moe's Pianos. I've played it once. And? It's kind of fun. I'm not a pianist. It's, it sounds different, right? I'm not a pianist, so I just got to touch it, you know. I mean, as close as I yeah, yeah. got to yeah. meeting Horowitz. Well, we s <laughs> Yuja doesn't travel with her piano yet. I don't know whether that is in her mind, but uh, she's tackling, or oh, as as Robert said, uh, one of the most famous piano concertos ever written, the Rachmaninoff Third, which is kind of uh, the peak of uh, piano works by Rachmaninoff himself. I mean, we are talking about a composer who, after presenting uh, his early works to the pu public, pretty much wanted to stop writing music overall because he got so heavily criticized and so destroyed by uh, the music dis uh, critics that he thought like, oh, I'm not going to write a note again. And then redemption came in the form of a second piano concerto and the third, which is undoubtedly the even deeper uh, piece of music. The second is a Wonderful piece of music, very brilliant, but the third goes just one uh, step uh, further. Yesterday, I was in Salem. We did this concert yesterday in Salem, and um, I had also a pre-concert talk, and my co-host... You didn't invite me. Sorry. <laughs> and my co-host uh, said the word neurotic piano concerto. Well... I wasn't expecting that, but for me that was a pitch to tell the story that uh, this piece uh, by Rachmaninoff, first of all, it's one of those pieces that was considered to be pretty much unplayable at the time it was written. It was written for one of the greatest pianists of the, the era back then, Josef Hoffmann, who never played it. Because maybe the technical difficulties, maybe the fact that he couldn't understand the musical meaning. A lot of things that we, on our days, do not even know why it happens. But okay, he didn't play it. Then the piece was premiered, great success. Two months later, there was another um, concert with Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. Rachmaninoff was playing, and guess who was the conductor? Gustav Mahler. That's a concert we would have liked to see, right? Because, speaking of neurotic, well... Uh, they yeah, those two incredible talents, but very different talents, collaborating would be really interesting. The interesting fact is that on one side, you have Rachmaninoff, who, and that, I would say, applies in a way to the style of this concerto, was not, in the sense, exuberant. You know, this is a concerto where you can throw your hair and do a lot of stuff, and, and even with the music, you can do a lot of traveling around be between tempos and rubato and gut and whatnot. And then you hear Rachmaninoff himself, there is a recording where he plays it. And there is none of that. It's, it is great playing. I mean, he was a player. To, and, but it's, I wouldn't say it's matter of fact what he does, but it's not overly sentimental. Rachmaninoff piano concertos, especially two and three, can get extremely sentimental. And I always think it's so nice when you have a soloist who doesn't completely lose his mind in sentimentality. And to pair Rachmaninoff with a conductor like, like Gustav Mahler, who for sure was musically and emotionally speaking all over the map in the best meaning of the word, must, must have been fantastic. And by the way, Rachmaninoff really liked him. He said, this is a guy with great ethics. He really commits himself to the works. He takes it very seriously. He rehearses it well. It was a match made in heaven. Nice to know. Now, I want you to know that Yu Wang will be at the Classical Millennium table in the lobby after the concert tonight to sign CDs, and they have her CDs. They don't have the brand new one that I played on the air 
yesterday or the day before or whenever it was, uh, because it hasn't been released yet. But we got an advanced copy from Deutsche Grammophon. But yesterday, you just told me that uh, there are some CDs uh, that uh, should be coming, but the truck is somewhere in the snow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to tell the classical millennium folks that you would like to have Yuja Wang's upcoming Rachmaninoff CD, which includes the concerto she's going to play tonight, you know, just give them your name and they'll let you know when it comes in. Well, that's that's great to know. She, I mean. Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto has been recorded over and over and over. And that because I talked a little bit about this over-sentimental interpretation the, the, and about the difficulties this, of this piece, the, the fact exists that on our day, uh, I wouldn't say any pianist, but really many pianists can play this piece, which is quite astounding because the the piece didn't get any easier. It's just that the, uh, that the technical abilities on our days are so insanely great. Now, having said that, the difficulty with the interpretation is there is still something to be done musically in this piece. And um, I can imagine that when you are very, very young, what are you going to do to really get a interpretation that makes some kind of sense. Well, um, I would guess this Rachmaninoff third piano concerto has probably been recorded around 120 times. And out of these 120, there are probably 15 or 20 interpretations that are really good. So you take 25 of those, and you listen, and then you say, oh, this is cute, I will do that. And then you take the other thing and say, oh, very nice, let's make that. And out comes a mishmash, which is not very, very, very good. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you is there is always, even uh, when you are young, because I remember those days, although long gone, <laughs> uh, that when, you, when there is a musical talent and you have certain capabilities that allow you to perform in public, you always have to remind yourself that there is a deeper meaning to the music even when the music is as technically brilliant as this piano concerto. And you have to constantly search for the meaning of music. And you do that very well, and we are all very grateful for your well, talent. I'm not that young. And your time in Portland, and all the good stuff that you do. You know, before we move on to the other works on the concert, I have one other question about this. Rachmaninoff was a big man. Stravinsky called him a six-foot scowl. He had huge hands. So he wrote music that he could play with his great big hands. How does Yuja Wang manage to stretch her hands out and play all that stuff? Does she roll a lot of chords? What does she do? I think that her technical capabilities in terms of speed with the fingers are just completely beyond belief. And of course, there are maybe a couple of chords that she, that Rahmanov simply did this and she had to go this way, a few, a few, but nobody, nobody, I, di I don't even notice. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, I don't even care because it's great playing anyway. So what's the point whether she breaks a chord or doesn't? All the notes are there. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. Okay, that's the second half of the concert. The big piece on the first half of the last of the six symphonies by the Danish composer, Carl Nielsen uh, is particularly known for his symphonies. Uh, he wrote some really fun concertos, too. I have a little tiny small world story. As you know, I work at a listener-supported radio station, so periodically I'm on the air asking people to show us the money so we can keep playing the music. Uh, and a year or so ago, I was on the air in membership mode, and I played the overture to Nielsen's opera, Masquerade. Totally delightful little overture. And after I played it, I just briefly said it was kind of a shame that we never get to hear that opera in this country because the opera is a blast. But, you know, when was the last time you heard anybody singing in Danish? You know, it just doesn't happen. A few minutes later, we got an online contribution from a woman listening in Copenhagen. Made my day, I'll tell you. And on, and on top of that, if you remember, there was this orchestra with this conductor who played the overture here in Portland. That's right. 
<laughs> Tonight, though, an equally fun, though considerably longer piece, the last symphony, he called it Sinfonia Semplice, uh, as if to say this is going to be a simple work, uh, but it's not. Well, uh, tonight I will also speak to the symphony before we play it because I think it helps me, everybody in the room, even those who are not here in the pre-concert talk, to set it up a little bit because um, although the, you are going to hear a really good piece of music, it's really strange. It's, so I, I maybe one hint, so I, uh, pardon me if I say things twice. The term Sinfonia Semplice Simple symphony refers to, in Nielsen's mind, to, yes, it's simple in comparison to my other symphonies. It's not a simple work, but um, don't think it's complicated in the sense of insanely brainy. Yes, it has some, he put a lot of thought into this, but I would say what you can take with you when you hear these four movements is the complexity for sure, the moodiness is crazy, and you will be baffled by the, dis I would say it's a very, dis the, the disparity of the character of the music, because it goes pretty much in every corner you can imagine, and the problem, if any, that it causes is you don't really know what is coming, and you don't really, at first hearing, know why it is there. And trust me, after conducting this symphony, sometimes I'm even surprised, how did it come about to write this, this way? So, um, the piece actually starts like a folk song. Very nice and play like wonderful. Then a second melody appears, which is very lyrical and very kind of a little bit emotional. But soon it will happen that some instruments start to disturb that very nice melody. And uh, it is a little bit like you are having um, a wonderful day of intensity in a very meaningful landscape, if that exists. Uh, with your siblings, many of them, and you or whoever constantly pokes them and is like, <laughs> ah, but not. And that is pretty much what happens in the first movement, if I can summarize it a little bit. The role of the poker is in the strings. The strings, after participating in this lyric song or a little bit in this folk song-like music, start to get somewhat angry while all the winds keep on singing and singing and having a good time, and then there is this Arr! And then everything gets extremely dramatic and very eerie, very like even intensely, I wouldn't say ugly, but like in a way that music at a certain point gets so harmonically dense that it's a little bit maybe unpleasant, uh, and then it dissipates again, and um, then the entire music ends of the first movement. Now, the second movement, which is called humoresque, it's actually the only piece where I can tell you the story of what is being described in music. Carl Nielsen, upon writing the symphony number no. six, of course, because he was this great man of Denmark, was asked by journalists, okay, is this program music? Is there a program to this film? And he said, yeah, there is a program. And the next interview, he said, no, 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 there is no program. This is absolute music. Okay, we just can say the second movement has a program. You imagine, please, a big room full of sleeping children. And some of these children wake up. And they start to make noise, the percussion. They make noise and they wake the others up. And at the beginning it's like, no, I don't want to wake up and so on. And, but little by little the percussion gets all the instruments to wake up. And we are talking only about selected woodwind instruments. 
The strings have nothing to do in this entire movement. And everybody starts to play, but you know how a room with a lot of children works. Some play here, some play there, some play there, and it has nothing to do with each other. It sounds a little bit like this. It's a mixture of stuff, and maybe there is a little fight going on and so on. In the end, because we are all thriving for, can we please have a melody that we can understand, and that is not like this, the clarinet and the tuba bassoons really start playing a melody. And you think, aren't these children gorgeous? They are really well behaved, they know what to do. And that them pretty much 10 seconds after, these wonderful children have a really folk-like melody, the biggest child of all wakes up the trombone and starts yawning. And that's what the trombone does during the... So you hear this... That's what the... Tr so that's the music of the second movement until everybody's tired of playing and they go to sleep again. The third movement, serious piece, would actually be quite, I would say, simple if, we, if he wouldn't have done what he does to mainly the second violins. It's a piece of very, very, very intense music, very slow, and I would say in the tradition of romantics, nothing to it. But then, the second violin, while this melody is still somewhere in the distance, Really, it's like somebody is constantly screaming all the time. And you think like, really? <laughs> and, but at the end it calms down and then we get to this grand finale uh, movement, which is a theme and variations. Um, now, the fun part of that is, and it shows very well this thing where I said disparity. It is you have an introduction, a theme. Theme is by the bassoon, folk tune-like, very easy to understand. First variation, okay, no, not very difficult to understand. Uh, second and third, it's okay, it's a little strange, but yeah. Uh, and then we start with a faster variation. And from the faster variation, everybody, specifically the, the strings, go crazy. It is so hard and so fast to play and uh, while every, the entire rest of the orchestra is like, oh fine, nice melody, but very muscular, the upper strings and the viola is like, <laughs> okay, fine. And you think like, what has happened? And from there he just stops and goes into a waltz. And you think, like, really? <laughs> and when the waltz progresses, and gets louder, there is one group in the orchestra, mainly the heavy brass, who always interrupts the waltz because they don't like to play a waltz. They play a different rhythm. And you think like, really? <laughs> and then, uh, then there is a very, um, very slow variation, kind of normal, and then we come to the variation, second to last variation, which he called the variation um, that should show Fate, death, knocking at your door. Only the percussion and the tuba play. That's it. Very short variation. And you think, oh, this will not end well. <laughs> but Nielsen just denied the triumph of death. There is a fanfare, and we get to the final uh, minute, if you will, of the music. And you will be really, really surprised how this piece end, ends. Uh, there is no piece in music that ends like this. You will enjoy it. It's funny music, in part. It's true. It, for all its difficulties and complexities, it's not a forbidding uh, music world. It, it's fun and quirky. And Your description of it was delightful. <laughs> Thank you. Doesn't that well, make you want to hear it? Well, <laughs> of course, I, I did this symphony. Okay, I'm, I'm lying, but it's nice to lie here and there. I did this symphony for Portland because Portland, we all, 
who live here pride ourselves Portland is weird. Well, this symphony is really weird. Okay. To end at the beginning, Johannes Brahms' tragic overture. It occurred to me this morning that if I could go back in time, one of the things I would want to do is go to the taverns where Brahms played when he was a kid. He earned money. He was so talented. He earned money playing the piano in very seedy environments in Hamburg. Yes, I did. Wouldn't it be fun to go back and see what that was like? My goodness, this poor innocent boy, way before the portly Brahms with the big beard that we think of, and he was actually a beautiful young man, working with all these sailors and, you know, those women, and goodness. You're very discreet. Only when there's a video camera present. <laughs> You can watch these Saturday night pre-concert chats at allclassical.org. That's why the video cameras here. Brahms himself, uh, I always said that if, if, you know, one of these questions that you are being asked sometimes in interviews is uh, if there would be a person with a musician, a famous musician with whom you could have dinner, who would it be? And I always said essentially one of them would be Johannes Brahms for me, but I probably wouldn't go because I would be so scared. Because he was, a, he was a scary mind, very strong personality. He wrote only two overtures in his life. One is funny and one is not. And he wrote both in the same year. And while the funny overture has a reason to be there, because he was, um, um, he was awarded the honorary doctorship of the University of Breslau, and he wrote for them the academic festival overture, the scholars have been fighting over, okay, what was the incentive for writing the tragic overture? And was it Hamlet? No, it wasn't. Was it Faust? It wasn't Faust either. Well, I th personally, I think there was no incentive. He just wanted to write a tragic piece of music, that's all. And for an overture, the tragic overture that you're going to hear tonight is rather long. Because the overtures rank between, let's say, five and a half and at the most eight and a half, nine minutes, if they are very substantial. And tragic overture is 13, 14 minutes, depending on how fast you take it. And it's very meaningful, very Brahmsian, very sometimes, in the best sense of the word, romantically dense music, where every note really matters, and it seems to be that the first sketches to this fabulous overture were written by Brahms, were sketched out many years before he started composing the work, so there is no incentive to this. But it's undoubtedly one of the very, very great pieces by Brahms, and it has also to be said that for all of us musicians, orchestras, and conductors who adore Brahms, like I do, we hold to every piece of music that we can get hands on because he unfortunately wrote only four symphonies and two piano concertos, a violin concerto, two serenades and these two overtures and that's it. A requiem. Oh, the requiem is so that beautiful. One. We have to stop so the orchestra can warm up so they can play their very best for you. And Carlos, since you alluded to the sometimes prickly personality of Mr. Johannes Brahms, uh, allow me to leave you with a Brahms quote. He left a party one time, and as he was going out the door, said, if there is anyone here who I have not offended, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos Kalmar. Robert McBride. <laughs> I know. <laughs>